Chapter 13. Peace Talks The offer of peace talks came after a year of semi-regular fighting along the northern desert borders of the Sword Marches. It caught Tonos and the rest of Yodia by surprise. The offer came without warning or preamble. A Falaji rider appeared at one of the Yodian outposts under a flag of truce, bearing a message for the Queen of Krug from the Kadir of the Sawardi. The message was relayed to one of the ornithopter bases deep within Yodian territory, and from there borne by air to the Privy Council at Krug. The council consisted of the Queen, the Seneschal, the Captain of the Guard, and Taunus. For a brief period a year earlier, Urza had attended the meetings faithfully, but soon he began sending his apprentices as his proxy. With the arrival of the Kadir's message, though, Urza appeared in the council at the Queen's right hand. Taunus stood behind the Chief Artificer's chair and to one side. The apprentice noticed that Urza's eyes did not leave the ornately scribed scroll now spread before them. An offer of peace, said Kayla. An offer of truce, corrected the seneschal with a slight quaver in his voice. A cessation of hostilities, a pulling back of forces while peace is being discussed. How bad are the hostilities? Kayla turned to the captain of the guard. The newest captain, as he was still thought of by many, was a thoughtful man and paused before he responded. Sporadic, but serious enough, he said and paused again. The mannerism bothered Tanos, but the others at the table had grown used to the captain's habit and let him gather his thoughts. They fall into two groups, he said. One seems to be a traditional raid of the Falaji type, a rapid push into our territory, looting a random town or cavern they encounter, then retreating before our forces can arrive. The other type of assault is carried out by a larger, more organized force that seems intent on destroying a specific target, such as a bridge, a mill, or a fort. The dragon engine often accompanies these raids. There is less looting, but more destruction. Those are organized attacks, said Urza softly. The others are just parties of desert raiders, seeking their own loot and glory. The attacks with the dragon engine are more organized and have a firm objective in mind. His eyes did not leave the parchment bearing the truce offer. Those organized raids have my brother's approval, and show his planning. Approved or not, ventured the seneschal. The effect is to demoralize the people of the Sword Marches and all on the River Mardun. The Falaji regularly raid the territories on the far side of the river, and rumors swirl that they plan an attack across it sometime in the near future. Are they indeed planning such an attack? asked Kayla, her voice firm and her manner dispassionate. Tonos noticed that in council, she usually let all sides speak, then made her decision. The seneschal looked at the captain, who paused, then said, We have no knowledge at this time. We have fortified encampments on the far sides of the river, with bonfire towers to warn us of any massed movements. The river is wide enough that even if they found or built sufficient boats, we'd be prepared for any assault long before they could launch it. Another pause. However, maintaining garrisons along the Marden stretches our resources even further. Kaya thought what about the newest captain said, then nodded. We can use the ornithopters for additional patrols. Those resources are stretching thin as well, said Urza. We have nearly 30 machines and 6 patrols of 5 each. If we get the power stones from Argai for which we have asked, then we could double that number. But the Argaiman crown is being, the lean man bit his lip, reticent. Kayla nodded again. From what Urza told her, the Argaimans were practically swimming in power stones, most of them from Tokasia's original encampment. However, it appeared that prying the stones from the ground was simple compared to prying them from the Argaimans' hands. Instead, she said, What is the status of the flights? Urza answered, while the captain was pausing. Five of the flights are in the field, at bases throughout the northern sword marches. The six is here at the capital. The sword marches' flights operate from permanent bases. I was thinking that we could establish a series of such bases along the border and move the flights from one to another as need be. The captain frowned and said, That would be taxing on the pilots. We have more capable pilots than we have craft for them to fly, Urza replied. The additional camps would give us sufficient maneuverability and increase our ability to respond and perhaps they would give us the same element of surprise that the Falaji are currently enjoying. The captain shook his head. The pilots need their rest. Should the machine sleep just because the men do? Asked Urza. There was a brittle irony in his voice. Tanos had seen this battle before. When it came to the ornithopters, the master artificer had more sway than the captain and the guard did. The captain paused for a moment, then shrugged his shoulders in defeat. Kayla watched the interplay coolly, then said, Urza. Provide any plans for multiple bases to the captain. In the meantime, it sounds as if we are stretched thin indeed. We have more than just ornithopters, said the captain. We have foot patrols, civilian riders, and cavalry patrols. He paused for a moment and looked at Urza. But yes, 
The continual raining has stretched us thin. Then we will accept the peace offer to talk, said Kayla. Perhaps together we can come up with a solution. Unlikely, said Urza. Their demands, made back at Corlinda, were direct, and left little room for negotiation. They want all the land they consider traditional Falaji territories. That includes the sore marches. Are you prepared to give that to them? Kayla shook her head firmly. It is part of my father's legacy, for good or ill. Still, we will talk, if nothing else, to show Yodia that what they deal with now is not the same one they dealt with at Corlinda. She rose from her seat, indicating the council was ended. The captain and seneschal rose as well. Urza, however, remained seated. The chief artificer reached out and tapped the parchment. The question is, he said to Tanos, are they the same Falaji we dealt with at Corlinda? The offer was accepted, and word was relayed back to the borders by Ornithopter. Negotiators set a date at the end of the next month at Krug itself. A route of safe passage was proposed by the Falaji through the heart of the sword marches. The captain of the guard protested, and the Seneschal countered offer a route along the Mardon River, just skirting the edges of the contested borderlands. The Seneschal expected the Falaji to reject any deviation from their demands, but was pleasantly surprised when they accepted the alternate route without change. In the capital city of Krug, preparations were subdued. anti falaji graffiti was carefully washed from the alleyway bricks, and a great open area was cleared before the city's thick walls for expected troops. Again, the Seneschal was pleased to discover that the Falaji would be bringing little more than an honor guard. He was less pleased to hear they would also bring the dragon engine. Urza and the newest captain took their own precautions. The palace troops were drilled to within an inch of perfection, and the normal garrison was supplemented by troops from the coastal regiments. They recalled a second flight of ornithopters from the sword marches to Krug to join five craft already there. Urza wanted ornithopters aloft directly over the Falaji procession as it moved south, but the Falaji bridled at this, making their displeasure known through the Seneschal. For several days, Taunus was sure that negotiations would break down over this point, but Urza at last relented. There would, however, be a regular cavalry escort while the Falaji were in Yodian territory. Urza also took the pains to review all the pilots of the ornithopters at the capital, in some cases, interviewing the young men himself. Taunus accompanied the chief artificer on several of these interviews, though he was puzzled by Urza's action. Most of the pilots were hand-picked and trained by Urza in the first place and were intensely loyal to the prince consort. As Urza talked to them, though, Tano saw what the artificer was worried about. Loyalty was not an issue. It was assumed, and indeed, Urza was considered halfway between a legend and a saint by his pilots. His questions focused on how the pilots felt about the Falaji, about the desert, about the long-running battles they had been fighting. He was, Tanos realized, looking into their temperaments, trying to discern if any would, accidentally or purposefully, attempt to finish the job the warlord had started. He was examining them as if they were just another component in a larger device, checking them for signs of wear and tear. Indeed, there were two individuals who confessed a hatred of the Falaji and one who promised his loyalty even when he disagreed with diplomacy. Urza relocated these young men to other flights and replaced them with more even-tempered individuals. In considering Urza's actions, Tanos realized the chief artificer had been caught by surprise once before and did not want to repeat the mistake a second time. With the precision that the apprentice had previously seen the chief artificer dedicated to his inventions, Urza investigated every unit stationed at the capital. He knew every merchant who claimed injury from the Falaji. And, Tanos knew, Urza had walked every inch of the walls that flanked three sides of Krug and along every inch of the shore of the Marjun, which served as the fourth protective barrier for the city. Still, the older man had little hope for the negotiations and said as much to Tanos. The Kadir wanted nothing less than the land that Kayla's late father had conquered, he reiterated, and she would not give it up. Then why negotiate at all? Tanos asked. Urza sighed deeply and said, Sometimes even foes should get together to talk. Nothing may come out of this talk, but if the sides can talk without incident, that gives hope for the next meeting. Tanos thought there was more than that. The meeting for which the chief artificer was planning so carefully was not Falaji and Yodian, he realized, nor Queen and Kadir. The meeting was between himself and his younger brother. The messages started arriving soon after the Falaji reached the borders of the sword marches, arriving at regular intervals as Urza had ordered. The Falaji contingent was smaller than that which they had presented at Corlinda, as the Kadir had promised. The dragon engine was present, but it was being used to pull a great metal wain, almost as big as itself, with huge gear-like wheels. While hitched to the wain, the engine moved slowly, keeping pace with the rest of the troops. The Yodian Council argued about the presence of the wain. The Seneschal suggested it might be a gift. The newest captain thought it might contain additional troops. Urza told Tanos it was a display of power, a reminder that Mishra had not been merely resting since Corlinda. In the end, 
Caleb chose not to make an issue of the unexpected addition to the Falashi party. Urza ordered one of the flights, grounded at the border, to return to normal operations, and a second to parallel the Falaji party, remaining to the east and out of sight. On the fifth day of the Falaji journey southward, five days before the arrival of the party in Krug, there were new rumors of amassing of Falaji troops on the far northern border of the sword marches. The Seneschal thought that, if true, it might be one of the more traditional raids, perhaps by individuals who want to see the negotiations crumble. The captain argued that, regardless of purpose, any Falaji incursions would be disastrous at this time and the ornithopters were needed to scout in the desert. Ursa at first refused it, only to be overruled by Kayla. Reluctantly, the chief artificer allowed three flights, including the one shadowing the dragon engine, to be reassigned to the far north. Urza did not explain to Talos the factors that convinced him to change his mind, but several of the household staff heard a serious row in the royal quarters. Talos knew that Urza spent the next few nights working late at the ornery. The chief artificer claimed to be working on improvements to the Avenger-style automatons, but thereafter, he attended the council only when specifically summoned by his wife. On the tenth day, the Falaji arrived before the walls of Krug. The battlements had been hung with colorful banners, as if festive bunting would conceal the strength and purpose of the stonework beneath. The walls were bedecked with most of the populace of Krug as well, as were the windows of every building that commanded a view of the visitors. The merchants made a killing selling telescopes, an Argivian fancy consisted of two polished lenses set along the length of a metal tube. Indeed, Krug seemed a city of observers as the Falaji party neared. Her Majesty, the Prince Consort, Tanos, the Seneschal, and the newest captain, waited with other bureaucrats at the North Gatehouse for the Falaji to present themselves. There were fewer Falaji than there had been at Corlinda, and the sunlight sparkled off the polished brass of their white helmets and heavy shoulder awnings. But few counted the number of men, for the dragon engine captured everyone's attention. Tanos, standing with the others at the gatehouse, was amazed by the beast. It was as if a living thing had been transformed into a machine. It was a dragon whose muscles had been replaced with cables, its hides with plates of metal, its eyes with great gems. It moved like a living thing as well, with little finches and muscle ticks, swinging its head slowly from one side to another, apparently curious about its surroundings. Urza had told Tanos of the engine and had said that Misha found it beneath the desert. But this was no Thran creation, Tanos thought, and it was as far removed from the chief artificer's Avengers as the living bird different from the ornithopters. Tanos was impressed, and that was with the prior warning from Urza. He could only imagine what the rest of the populace were thinking. The dragon engine was in harness, like a caravan ox, and pulled the huge wagon almost as large as itself. The wain, though, held no sense of wonder, as did the mechanical beast harnessed to it. The wagon looked like a metallic four-story engine that had been given wheels and turned loose on the world. Its sharp angles and exposed rivets marked it as originally being of Thrain design. Numerous portals and battlements bristled along its flanks, set with catapults and small ballista. The weapons were unloaded for the moment, and wrapped beneath tarps that no more concealed their purpose than the banners did the walls of Krug. Kayla had ordered the ornithopters displayed outside the walls, one flight to either side of the north gate. They were on the ground, their crews standing ready next to them. They were intended both as reassurance and as a warning, much as a sheathed sword lay upon a table, might remind one's opponent that while there was no intention of treachery, the negotiators were prepared to fight. The pilots, in blue and white tabards, waited patiently by their machines. The Falaji formed a line opposite them, a respectful distance away. The dragon engine and its burden drew up before the gates and came at last to rest. As it did so, Tanos noted something Urza had not mentioned. A dull throbbing came from the beast as fluids gurgled through hidden tubes and hydraulic joints shifted in place. The humming was akin to a heartbeat, and Tanos could feel it more than he could hear it. The machines came to rest, and after a short interval, a door opened in the side of the great wing. A staircase was lowered, and down the stairs came two figures. Neither was the Kadir. Instead, Mishra led the way, followed by his assistant. Tanos had not met either, yet from the way Misha carried himself, Tanos knew he must be Urza's brother. The younger brother was shorter, heavier, and dark-haired with a tightly trimmed beard. But there was something in his walk and in the face beneath that beard that marked him as kin to the chief artificer of Krug, Prince Consort of Yodia. Misha was bedecked in the flowing robes of a desert prince, his head bare, and his face beaming with a great smile. He blinked in the afternoon sun and waved to the crowds on the battlement. There were catcalls among the responding cheers, but the younger brother seemed not to notice. Yet much as the wing was diminished by the dragon engine that served it, so too was Mishra diminished by his companion. She was a slender woman, with hair the color of bloodstained rubies, dressed in dark clothes, a flowing cape billowing behind her. She carried a simple, unadorned staff of black wood, and seemingly did not recognize the crowd's shouts, for she kept her gaze forward. From Urza's description, Tanos knew this must be Ashnod. No Kadir emerged from the metallic wing, and in the gatehouse, 
the Yodian leaders held a quick conference. If the Kadir was not present, noted the Seneschal, then the Queen should not appear either for the initial welcoming. A group similar in protocol should respond to the Falaji's initial delegation. More might be taken as a sign of weakness, less as an insult. That meant Urza and Tanos would greet the new arrivals. The chief artificer nodded, his face stiffening slightly as he saw his brother on the field. Tanos thought the artificer would rather speak with his brother privately, but this was not to be. The queen would remain at the gatehouse as the artificer and his apprentice met the Falaji representatives. Urza was stiff and formal as they crossed the open space between the city and the Falaji. Tanos kept an appropriate two paces behind and to the right, marshaling his own features to a calm demeanor. Urza stopped before Misha and Ashan and without preamble, raised his empty hand slightly as if he were a priest giving benediction. Welcome to Krug, brother, he said. Misha flung both arms outward, and for a moment, Tanos thought the younger brother was going to rush his elder and hug him. Instead, Misha bowed deeply. Tanos noted that Ashna gave a short bob of the head as well. We are honored by your invitation, said Misha, rising again. The smile on his face could be earnest, thought Tanos, or it could be the pasted on smile of a Falaji trader. We are honored by your presence, said Urza, though his words sounded to Tanos' ears dry and bloodless. Is your Kadir with you? Alas, said Misha, bowing again deeply. I fear that his most wise and earnest presence could not accompany us on our mission of peace and mercy. Our empire is wide now, and there are other matters that require his attention. Urza was silent for a moment, and Tanos could see the muscles tighten along his jawline. We should have been told if your leader was otherwise occupied, he said at last. We understand your disappointment, replied Misha quickly. Be assured that it is shared by our most poison and powerful master. I will not lie to you, brother. After his last experience with your people, he wishes to be cautious. He has entrusted me the power to negotiate fully on his behalf. However, if we are unwelcome because of his absence, we apologize and will humbly retreat the way we came. He bowed a third time. Tanos realized the younger brother was not making his exaggerated movements for Urza, but rather for the large number of Yodians lining the walls. Even if the chief artificer had wanted to, he could not now send the Falaji representatives away. Tanos held his face in a mask of solemn indifference, as he had back when as a lad, he listened to his uncle speak. He kept his eyes forward, looking past Misha into the middle distance. After a few moments, he realized he was looking at Ashot over her master's left shoulder. She too had the impassive look on her face, of a child who is expected to behave herself while the parents talk. Tanos blinked, realizing the red-haired woman might think he was staring at her, and moved his gaze a few feet to the left toward one of the wheels of the great metal wain. As he did so, Ashnot caught his eye and winked. It was a flutter, accompanied by the ghost of a smile. Tanos started, his eyes darting back to the scarlet-haired woman, but by that time, her face was an impassive diplomatic mask. All this occurred in the time it took for Urza to respond. You are welcome as the representative of your people, he said. Let me present you to the queen. If you will follow me. A brief bow here, and Misha added softly, And let me say, you are looking well, brother. I would have been heartbroken if you had perished at Corlinda. It is, begun Urza, and paused. The world seemed to turn around them for a moment. Then he continued, It is good to know you are safe as well. About Corlinda. Misha held up a hand. We can speak of the matter at length. Let me say that I have given it much thought over the past year. We will talk, but for the moment, we should not keep your queen waiting. Urza's face tightened for a moment, then relaxed, and he nodded. Of course. With that, he spun on his heel and walked back toward the gate. Misha followed, accompanied by the woman. Tanos brought up the rear. The red-haired woman hesitated as she passed the apprentice. She turned slightly and said, You must be Tanos. She held out her hand. Automatically, Tonos took her fingers and bowed slightly over them. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm Tonos, apprentice to Urza. You are Misha's chief apprentice, Ashnod? Ashnod withdrew her hand, and again a small smile played over her face. Chief and only, she said. It is typical of those two that they wouldn't bother to introduce us. Brilliant, Misha is, but he sometimes has the social graces of an atog. It must run in the family, eh? Tonos tried to form a response but by the time he had thought of something relatively innocuous, she had turned back and was following the two brothers toward the gate. Tano shook his head slightly and brought up the rear, arriving at the gate as Urza was presenting Kayla, rolling off her various titles like a schoolmaster reading the role. Flower of the Mardun, Warlord's Daughter, Queen of the Yodians, and War Lady of Krug, my wife, Caleb and Krug, concluded Urza. Mishra, 
the chosen representative of the Falaji. The Kadir was unable to attend and begs our forgiveness. Tonos noted that Urza was looking at the seneschal as he said it, and that the nervous man flinched at the implied accusation. Kayla offered her hand to the younger brother. Urza spoke to me of your beauty, said Mishra, bowing deeply over her hand. But I have forgotten his capacity for understatement. For him, a majestic tree is only so many board feet of lumber, and a desert vista only so many miles to cross. So too, I see that he has seriously unvalued your charm. A small smile played across Kayla's face. Tonos thought the queen was amused, though she had long since become immune to fulsome praise. Urza had spoken of his brother, but I must admit that I was unprepared for one so eloquent. I have few regrets in life, said Misha, still grasping the queen's hand lightly. And one of them is that I never had a sister. With you as my brother's wife, that is now remedied. With that, he loosened her hand, and she gently withdrew it. There were other introductions. Ashnod, Tanos, the Seneschal, and the Captain of the Guard, and arrangements were made for the Flashy to bivouac around the Dragon Engine. But the part that Tanos remembered later, after it was all said and done, was with the stony stare which Urza favored his younger brother, as Mishra flattered Kayla, and Mishra's toothy white smile as he regarded his brother's wife. Sounds of the fight carried all the way down the hall. Tonos had passed a gaggle of chambermaids, speeding away from the royal quarters. Then he heard the arguing voices reverberate like steel balls against the surrounding walls. Closer still, the air itself gained weight and potency. He felt as if he were back on the seacoast, watching the squall weigh the shore, pushing the air in front of it. Undeterred, he pressed forward. The door to the quarters was shut, but that did little to blunt the noise from within. This close, Tonos could make out the words, and he paused a moment before knocking. The answer is no, shouted Urza. It is a good trade, rejoined Kayla, just as loudly. They will leave the sword marches alone. It is not yours to trade away, thundered Urza. Tonos never heard the chief artificer that loud before, even when he was bawling out the most incompetent of apprentices. Tonos hesitated at the door. Would it be better to interrupt and make them aware that their fight was resounding through the palace, or to wait for a lull in the shouting? Tonos knocked. There was a testy growl of, what? From the other side, coupled with a more feminine disciplined, Enter. Tonos entered the room cautiously and said, The Falaji delegation is waiting for the tour of the ornery chief artificer. Urza shot his apprentice a look as frosty as the Rono Glacier. Yes, thought Tonos. This was a particularly bad time to interrupt. Across the room, Kayla was standing, hands folded in front of her. In the Privy Council, that usually meant that a particular subject was closed. If you want me to conduct the tour, added Tonos, but Urza already had his hand up. I'll be there, said the chief artificer, as Tonos knew he would. The idea of his brother padding through his research area without Urza being present was unthinkable. To his wife, Urza snapped, This discussion is not over, my wife. Kayla nodded curtly. You are correct, my husband. Urza gave a sharp half bow and left the room. Kayla said, Tonos, remain for a moment. Tonos looked at the chief artificer. Urza scowled, then gave Tonos a nod. Come along when you can, he said, and then he was gone, his formal cape billowing behind him. Tonos turned back to the queen. Your majesty, he said, then added, ma'am. You heard our discussion out in the hall, she said. Tonos took a deep breath. I think they heard your discussion in the domes of Tomokul. Kayla smiled and slumped into one of her chairs a heavy throne-like monster with ornately carved arms. I did not hear much of it, continued Tonos quickly. The stonework carries the intensity, but not the nature of your words. Kayla laced her hands, templed her fingers, and touched them to her lips. Would you say the talks have gone well these past few days? Very well, replied Tonos. And indeed, they verge on phenomenal, considering the abortive talks in Corlinda. Gifts had been presented, toasts had been exchanged, platitudes had been spoken, and effusive compliments had been offered. Private meetings between Kayla and Misha had led to discussions among the Falaji and in the Privy Council. The good feelings between the two sides had culminated in Urza's offer to show his brother his ornery. In return, Misha had offered to let Urza and his assistant look at the Dragon Engine and Great Wayne. Things were going very well indeed. And Ambassador Misha, asked Kayla. Your opinion of him? Tanos hesitated, unsure of what Kayla wanted to know. He is... The apprentice searched for words. He is like his brother, only different, more effusive, more willing to talk. 
but no less guarded, said Kayla. Thanos thought for a moment. Yes, despite all the talk and praise and compliments, Misha remained even more close than his brother. He seemed earnest, but was his earnestness the truth or only a mask? Thanos realized he would never think of Urza in that fashion. I rarely know what Urza is thinking, but that is because he is quiet. I do not know what Misha is thinking, because he is talking. Kayla gave a small smile and said, He is very charming, and I've heard that the desert traders have the ability to talk a snake out of its skin. Do you think he has the ability to enforce any deal made here? Thanos nodded. He brought the dragon engine with him. The men who follow him apparently think well of him. Kayla was silent for a moment, then said, Do you think we could trust him? Thanos held up his hands. I don't think we have given him much chance to prove our trust so far. Indeed, said Kayla, and pressed her fingers to her lips. What if I were to tell you that Misha was prepared to sign a treaty recognizing Yodia's claim to the sword marches? Amazed, Thanos said, The Kadir is willing to do this? Kayla held up a finger. I said, what if? Diplomacy is filled with what ifs, idle ideas that are launched. If they fail to fly, they are quickly denied and more quickly forgotten. Like prototypes in the ornery, smiled Thanos, and he thought about the nature of the offer. What would be the price for such a boon? Kayla nodded. The declared prices involve protection of Falaji natives among our populace, guards for their caravans within our lands, and a token payment for the land seized, but no formal apology for seizing it, along with the recognition of the Kadir as the ruler of the United Falaji people. In national terms, these are very small things indeed, but there is one last piece, and that is the sticking point. Kayla was quiet for a moment, and Thanos did not interrupt the pause. When she spoke again, it was in cool tones. What are the abilities of Urza Stone, the one he wears around his neck? He's Might Stone, said Thanos. Light broke over him. Mishra wants his brother's talisman. What does it do? persisted Kayla. He is rarely without it. Thanos thought about what he had seen Urza do with the stone. Slowly, he replied, it seems to make artifacts and creatures more powerful with a limited range. He uses it to heal flawed power crystals, but it seems to work that way only in his hands, and he holds it when he is thinking, though that may be just force of habit. Good Sir Mishra has his own stone, made to his brothers, said Kayla. Has he told you that? Thanos was silent for a moment, then shook his head. I was surprised at that as well, the more so that it was Mishra who told me, said Kayla a ripple of irritation evident in her voice. So the stone has some power, and Misha wants it. Misha said his stone sang to him. Does Urza's stone sing? Not that I have noticed, said Thanos. Nor I, agreed Kayla. The ambassador may be using some desert idiom I am not familiar with, so it may just be a flowery illusion. Yet the fact remains that Misha is willing to guarantee peace, backed by his dragon engine and other devices he has hinted at, all if Urza will give up his stone. Tana shook his head. Urza would not do this, I think. You think correctly, said Kayla gloomily. Hence the discussion that shook the halls of this palace. The Queen of Yodia placed her palms together, fingers extended, and twisted them a quarter turn against each other, then back. It struck Tana that he had seen Urza use the same mannerism when faced with a problem in design. He wondered if the Queen had picked up the habit from the Prince Consort or the Chief Artificer from his royal wife. I do not think it would do the nation harm if Misha was to get the other half of his stone, she said. But it might do Urza harm, replied Thanos. In doing so, it could harm the nation. Agreed, said Kayla, again twisting her palms against each other, then setting them down in her lap. But can I let this opportunity pass by? Am I condemning the sword marches to continual raids and the rest of the country to a constant military footing because of an item coveted by both brothers? Thanos was silent for a moment, then said, Urza is right. Kayla's face fell, but Thanos added, You both need to talk more on the subject. You and Urza. You and Mishra. Mishra and Urza themselves. Perhaps there is some common ground that frees the sword marches. Perhaps Mishra is merely testing the waters, trying the prototype of an idea to see what your reaction is. Perhaps he asks for the stone and will settle for something else. Something you don't know he wants yet. Kayla sighed. These are problems of rulership. There are some situations that resist all easy solutions. Which is why I'm trying to avoid providing you with any, said Thanos. Kayla nodded. Your talents are wasted as Ursa's apprentice, Thanos. 
You would make an excellent seneschal. Thanos winced comically. You already have an excellent seneschal. And if I were not Urza's apprentice, who would you talk to about the prince consort? That sally brought a true smile to Caleb and Krug's face. Agreed. That'd be off with you. Be sure to tell me how the brothers are getting along. Thanos rejoined the chief artificer at the ornery as Urza was explaining the better control of the wing surface with a double bench structure. Misha was attentive and seemed to ask all the right questions, leading Urza each time into his next point. Urza, for his part, was scholarly but not pedantic about his work. To Thanos, there seemed to be no friction between the brothers, and he deemed it likely that the subject of the stone had not arisen on either side. Thanos looked around. Most of the rest of the flashy seemed bored beyond human conception, and the students present had heard most of Urza's explanations before. They were staring at the odd bits of the ornery, trying to keep them from falling asleep. Ashnot, however, was watching Thanos. When he looked her way, she turned her head back to the two brothers. Then, as soon as he turned away, he could feel the pressure of her eyes on him. It made him very uncomfortable. Thanos had assumed from what Urza had said that Ashnot was Misha's lover as well as his student. Yet the two did not behave as intimates. And that earlier wink, if it were truly a wink, and now these stares that were not stares, told a different story entirely. The talk lasted through most of the early afternoon. Misha made a number of small suggestions of his own concerning the design, while Urza pointed out what other changes they would necessitate. Finally, it became clear they would not have time to tour the dragon engine as well that evening, and indeed, there would be much rushing about if that evening state dinner was to go off as planned. Misha was effusive in his apologies. I can see that you've achieved much here. Once there is peace, I hope to be able to establish my own small foundry and laboratory, he said. When you do, responded Urza, let me send you the notes on my teaching experiences. I discovered that certain methods work better than others in holding the attention of young men. As if we never had that problem when we were young, said Misha with a laugh, and Urza managed a tight smile. Yes, thought Thanos. Urza had not entirely forgotten the argument with Kayla, but he was not going to let it spill out before his brother. It would not be he who created an incident, not he who spoiled his wife's hope for peace. The state dinner was held within the great courtyard, an open celebration in the Falaji style to honor the guests. Every cushion and throw rug in the palace was pressed into service, and a fine repast of roast lamb and spiced chicken was laid out for the attendees who sprawled alongside low tables. The Falaji, after too many suppers and stiff back chairs, were notably at ease, whereas the Yodians continually shifted and moved to find suitable resting places. The Seneschal had found a band of Muhari musicians in the city who had no qualms about playing for members of the Sawardi clan, and the air was filled with their high-pitched strings and hearty shouts. Kayla sat with Urza on one side of her, Bishra on the other. She spoke with both, though she was mostly attentive to her husband, at one point offering him a date stuffed with cheese. He did not let her feed him, but rather took the fruit from her hand and smiled at her, popping the treat into his mouth. Those city folk who watched the royal couple were no doubt delighted by their display of affection. To Thanos, it was a sign that perhaps the storm in their private quarters had blown over. Mishra, for his part, when talking to Kayla, continually extolled some virtue or another of desert life. The meal ran eight courses in the Yodian tradition, but all the courses were falaji dishes. In addition to the lamb and chicken, there was a broiled fish done with hot peppers, salads of spinach and goat cheese, and all manner of salted meat. Everything was served with a pungent wine smelling of cinnamon. The wine called Nabiz was as potent as it was pungent, and Thanos noted that a number of Yodians used it to offset the discomforts of sprawling across the pillows. Most of his table consisted of Falaji lieutenants, who laughed among themselves, and once, when a recognizable tune appeared from the band, rose to engage in a long line dance. Misha joined them, keeping pace with their kicks and flourishes. A shadow moved along Thanos' side. Interesting, no? asked Ashan, as she settled down next to Thanos. Traditional warriors dance, replied Thanos. Ashan held out her cup, one of the gold ones from the warlord's 10th anniversary celebration. Thanos reached for the ear of Nabiz and refilled the goblet. Ashnod made a rude noise at Thanos' words. It's one more boys only tradition, she said with a slight slur in her voice, and Thanos wondered how much wine she had already. The Falaji are typically chauvinist, and the Sawari the worst of the pack. Misha had to practically club the Kadir over the head to agree to negotiate with a woman in the first place. Women should be out raising the children and baking flatbread, not getting involved in politics, war, religion, science, or any of the rest of that boy stuff. Thanos did not let a surprise at Ashnot's words show. Times change for all of us, he said. Perhaps the Falaji will change as well. Not in my lifetime, or in yours, returned Ashnot. 
She pressed a slim hand against her bare breastbone and stifled a burp. They are here, negotiating with a woman, and things are going well. And you, a woman, are among their number, Tano said. I am merely tolerated, replied the red-haired woman. I am Misha's apprentice and assistant. The great Misha is as much the leader of the Falaji now as the Kadir, and the chiefs trust him more than they do the fat young pup currently running things. So they put up with me, and the Falaji legends say things about dangerous women with red hair. She set down her cup and ran both hands through her long tresses, arching her back as she did so. So they fear me as well. Should they? asked Tanos. He knew he was feeling the effects of the Nabi's work through his system as well, but he could not suppress his interest in this woman. Fear me? said Ashna with a devilish smile. I'd like to think so, but if Misha let them tomorrow, I would be gone as well before nightfall. Of that, I have no doubt. Tanos made no comment, and instead looked at the dancers. Most of the flies had joined the dance, which had transformed from a line into a spiral curling onto itself. Misha led the procession, and enticed the spindling seneschal to accompany him. The bird-like man tried to mimic Misha's steps, and did an admirable job miming the steps, bows, and shouts. Other members of the palace staff had joined the procession, but both unfamiliarity and spiced wine worked against them, reducing them to mere shufflers in the procession. The Falaji did not seem to mind, and in fact seemed to spur them to increased gyrations and bellows. Things are going very well, said Tanos. Better than you could imagine, said Ashot softly. What do you think of the ornery? asked Tanos. More impressive than I expected, replied Ashot, shaking her hair back. Master Mitra is jealous, you know. Not that he admitted, but he's been talking about it getting a place to set up his own work for years. I think that's why he wants this peace treaty. He's been recruiting artisans from Tomokul and Zigan, but he has no permanent place for them. Tanos nodded. Ashna was sharing more than she should, but he had no problems listening to her. Still, he said, it is a pity we ran long at the ornery. I would have liked to have examined... Tano stared into her stormy eyes and almost lost his thought. Misha's dragon engine, he finished lamely. Who's to say you can't? asked Ashad. Well, there is always tomorrow, said Tanos. Ashad shook her head. Not tomorrow. Tonight. Tano stared at her. There's a banquet going on. Later, said Ashad. Listen, can you get past the Yodian guards on our wing of the palace? Tanos thought for a moment. They know me. I don't think that would be a problem. And I could get past the brass hats guarding the engine said the woman, shaking her head again. They know me, and fear me, remember? I can give you a private tour. Interested? Tano stammered for a moment, and Ashot added, Come on, we're supposed to be students. That means we occasionally play hooky. You've never played hooky? Never, said Tanos, and realized he was blushing. Well, hardly ever. You? Ashot's face became suddenly stern, mocking her companion. Never she said in a low, masculine tone, then smiled and winked, a definite wink this time. Well, hardly ever. So, are you interested? Tanos realized that it might be an opportunity to gain additional insights into Mishra for the queen and the chief artificer. Yes, he said at last. I think I'd like that. Dandy, said Ashad, rising smoothly from her seat without a sign of the effects of the alcohol she had been consuming. After the midnight bell, come to my quarters, and bring a civilized, decent, dry wine, will you? All this desert wine is like liquefied candy. With that, she was gone, disappearing along the edges of the cluster of the drunken Falagian Yodians, all bellowing and shuffling to the music, forming an ever-growing maelstrom of celebrants.